I greet you all in the very blessed name of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Tonight we embark on a new blessedness of the Christian walk on earth, specifically that of being persecuted. The Lord says, blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness sake. May the Lord help us to learn much from all this. And let us all turn to God first and foremost in prayer. Let us all pray. Eternal Almighty God, we gather giving you thanks for your mercies to thy house, and especially for this tremendous privilege to study your word again, and even more immense privilege to pray to the living God. We come seeking, O oh God, that you be merciful and gracious to first and foremost cleanse us and wash us thoroughly in the blood of our Saviour, wherein we have sinned against you in our thoughts, in our deeds, in our words, O oh Lord, may you show us that we may confess and repent. Forgive us, O oh God, for how little sensitivity we have towards sin. And Lord, we come pleading that you would help us to learn much from this particular beatitude. And we pray that, you, Lord, it would increase our um, resolution to live out the beatitudes in our life on earth. That thy image will be clearly shown through our lives, that we may bring glory to your name, that we may, be, we may be useful vessels for your use. So be in our midst, we also ask again, Lord, thou would help us as we seek to concentrate, as we seek to leave the cares and the worries and the thoughts of our schoolwork, of our housework, of our um, jobs, to leave them behind and, Lord, to be lost in thy presence. May you help us, O God. Speak to us, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Now tonight, we first and foremost want to learn, well, generally what is this about? Look at um, this particular beatitude. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake. Persecuted for righteousness' sake. Now generally, what is this about? Well, this is a description, all right? Description, being persecuted for righteousness' sake, is a description of the Christian who would stir up, all right, the anger, the hatred. They will provoke, all right, the, um, the, the rage in wicked men, unbelievers, sometimes even believers, right, against themselves, right? As a result, they will be persecuted. Now, but what is it about? Why are you persecuted? Because of your earnest desire to live righteousness before men, before God. So when you live righteously before God and men, it will stir up, it will inflame the anger of unbelievers, especially against you. And as a result, they would, in their hearts and in their actions, desire to do you harm. As you do what is good, when that is what is right in God's eye, they will oppose you, all right? They will do whatever is in their power, right, to hurt you, trouble you, make life difficult for you. Now, this is this general idea of what it means to be persecuted for righteousness' sake, for righteousness' sake. Now, before we go further to learn what is persecution, um, what is uh, righteousness' sake? Well, I think it is important for us to, at this point, ask ourselves, now, why is it important to learn this particular beatitude? Now, many of the beatitudes has to do with you behaving in a certain way. But this beatitude is somewhat different. It is about, well, you receiving something. All right? Most of it is, for example, well, being poor in spirit, um, 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 mourning, um, being meek, um, hungering and thirsting after righteousness, being merciful, um, being pure in heart, and being a peacemaker. It has much to do with you trying to live out certain things. But this beatitude is, is, in, is kind of unique. It is receiving something. Receiving something, and then how you must think how you must respond in that situation. So the Beatitudes also include 
you responding to something coming upon you, all right? And if you notice, it is found at the end of the Beatitudes, found at the end of the Beatitudes. So it is significant to understand where the Lord places it and therefore why it is important for us to learn it. Now, first reason why it is important to learn this is as we live out the Beatitudes, Christian, as we live out the Beatitudes, you have to expect persecution. Because it simply says, for righteousness' sake, the Beatitudes reflect the Christian's righteousness before God, living according to how God wants him to live, reflecting the, the characteristics of God, which is righteousness. When you do that, now, God tells you, you have to expect, you have to expect persecution for the sake of living out the Beatitudes. It is found at the end as an encouragement, in other words. So the first thing I hope that we learn um, to pay attention to this and understand why it is important, right? And not take it as well. We've heard this many times in First Peter, um, and we've covered it in detail, all right? Well, it's just another same thing. I think the Christian must begin to realize this is the Lord encouraging the believers. After telling them how to live out the Beatitudes, then He encourages them, all right? When you do that, you will, be, you will face persecution. I am encouraging you, strengthening you, preparing you. So that's the first thing why the Christian must understand why the Lord included this uniquely. It's not adding another how to live out. Um, the Christ-like life, but now how to respond when you live out the Christ-like life. Now, the Christian must, in peacetime, learn this. Because, well, maybe among us, some of you may be experiencing something like that. You're trying to live for Christ, and then you experience these challenges, this this persecution from others. It can be just situations as well, the difficulties. But I think for many of us, maybe, well, you, you don't feel it. Your life has been quite good. Now, please turn with me to this warning, First Peter chapter 2. First Peter, uh, sorry, First Timothy chapter 2. First Timothy chapter 2. Here is also a promise of God. That comes with a warning. First Timothy chapter 2. First Timothy chapter 2. Let's read from verses 12 to 14. 12 to 14 reading. Yea. Uh, sorry, First Timothy chapter 2, verses 12 to 14 reading. Yea. And all that live. Am I correct? Did I copy it wrongly? First Timothy chapter two twelve to fourteen. Oh no, wrong. Chapter three. Second Timothy chapter three. Yes, sorry. Thank you. Now, let's read 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 12. Yes, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 12 to 14. Now, reading. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Now, here is a very strong warning, all right, First, from verses 12. To 13, now all that will live godly in Christ Jesus. In other words, all that will live out righteousness. Now, when we are people who want to live out righteousness, godly lives, the Bible promises that we shall suffer persecution. It will happen. So, Christian, this is the reason why we must 
um, remember this beatitude and be prepared is because persecution is expected, right? It's an expectation that will occur in your lives, in my life. Now, some of the students you come over, or some of you when you join the church, or some of you over time when you learn new doctrines, it becomes clearer about how you should live, how you should bring up your children, how the family should be like, how you should be, be like in school. Now, initially, it seems to be fine and you're very excited. But is it not your common experience? After some time, you begin to face pressure from others, persecution from others. I remember a young Christian said, well, when he got saved and then was so excited to, to, to finally join a church and then found a church um, that, that teaches. So all things was going quite well initially, right, living it out. Then soon, in school, persecution began. Then least of all, to expect the home, in the home, right, trouble began. Why? Why? The Lord already said so. If you live godly in Christ Jesus, you shall suffer persecution. It will come. This is a great um, important reminder. If after many years, life seems well, you must know that this, this, um, this promise of God, so to speak, that you shall suffer persecution will eventually occur. So this beatitude is to prepare you, right? Prepare you to, for your heart to be expecting this. So when it occurs, you don't feel like it's something strange occurring to you, like Peter said. Don't think it's strange. It is not strange. Now, that is the first thing, that the reason why we must learn this well. Now, furthermore, there is a reminder um, that God gives that we cannot escape. We cannot, uh, or, or should not say cannot escape. We, we expect that this to happen, and therefore the Christian must not give up. Now, let's continue reading. Um, Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 3, now verse 14. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing whom thou hast learned them from, learned, learned them, all right? So here is the encouragement. God, knowing that the Christian will suffer that, now it's to encourage, to encourage the wavering feet. Just now we sang, all right? The wavering feet, all right? The feet that is wavering, that is the heart that is fearful and beginning to become weak and beginning to feel that, well, you know, um, it is getting too difficult and if I continue, the persecution will increase. But the Bible says, but continue thou in the things which thou hast learned. The things you have learned about the beatitude, the things you have learned ongoing in church, in your quiet time, in FEBC courses, through FEBC courses. When persecution occurs, no, God says, but continue thou. Continue. Now, this is a reminder that the Christian cannot be a soldier of Christ if you do not receive, embrace this beatitude. You cannot be a soldier of Christ because you will, you will give in. You will give up in that battle. In the battle, the enemy seeks to persecute, seeks to cause fear. So this beatitude is something that is, that is like I keep saying, is, is different from the rest. All right? This is a stirring for you to continue in the beatitudes, continue in the in in following after what God tells you to be, to be a godly person. So that's the second reason, right? If the first one is the reminder that it will come, and therefore we must be prepared. The second one is to remind us to be a soldier of Christ. You must endure persecution for living as a, as a soldier of Christ. Now the reality is this. Satan, who is the prince of this world, 
He will never cease. He will never cease to stir up unbelievers in the world or even so-called Christians to stir them up with rage to bring forth hostilities towards you at the workplace, in the school, in the home, among relatives. Satan will stir up people to do that. Now then, because of that, um, it is very difficult for the flesh to accept, isn't it? To accept that, well, if I live a godly life, um, I thought I should, be, I should be blessed. But instead, I will face persecution. It is very difficult for the Christian flesh to accept that. I thought if I serve the Lord and live according to His will and His ways, well, I thought life would be good. So the third reason that the Christian must know this beatitude well and embrace it is, now your flesh will not like it. Your flesh will not like persecution because you feel it is unfair, unjust, and your flesh will feel, why? We'll keep asking, why? Why is this happening? Why? Then the flesh must remind, then you must remind yourself, Satan will not stop trying to dissuade me. Satan will not stop trying to frighten me. Satan will not stop because, simply because Satan hates righteousness. So the third reason is for the Christian to remind yourself, it will come. For a soldier of Christ, I must endure and I know that my flesh will not like it. Will not like it. My parents will be the most difficult people for me to accept persecution from, right? I obey the Lord. I want to follow the Lord's way. Now, if your friends, and especially if strangers, uh, make it difficult for you and so on, um, embarrass you, ridicule you, ostracize you. Now, you find it easier to receive and you can put it aside more easily. But when it is loved ones, your parents, your siblings, your spouse, either because they are unbelievers or because, well, they don't agree with, with your understanding of scriptures and your obedience to scriptures, they can make life very difficult. They can pressurize you, they can threaten you. Now, there are Christians who, when they become believers, right, um, the family, um, well, they, they, face, they face difficulties with friends. Right? Friends begin to say, oh, you know, why, why, do you, why are you no longer running with us and all that? But when families begin to put pressure, um, the flesh finds it the most difficult to accept. Hence, God says, um, the man's greatest enemy, especially the godly man's greatest enemy, is the home. It's the home. Some get threatened to be thrown out of the house. Right? It's not uncommon to be threatened as a student in school to not receive financial support. Right? Some say, then you take care of your education yourself. And you feel all this. The flesh will begin to feel the pain and the fear and the unwillingness. Why, Lord, why? Why is it that when I became a Christian and I started to obey you, all these things started? Then this beatitude must come to your mind. Maybe it has not happened yet, like I keep saying. Maybe it has not happened yet. Maybe the Lord is gracious to spare you from this at this point of time for you to keep growing. He has not permitted ungodly persecution upon you yet at the workplace, in the school, at the home. But it is in times, in this time of peace, and you find that um, 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 there's no such things happening in your life, it is for you to begin to meditate upon this doctrine, strengthen your resolve, and be ready. When it happens, it is not only not a shock, but your heart is braced for it, and you want to, and you want to live it out. You want to embrace this beatitude. So don't think of beatitudes as just things you should live out to show people, all right? You begin to see beatitude, this beatitude has to do with that readiness to accept persecution and then to persevere and to continue in it. 
This is a beatitude. Of course it is, because Christ went through all that. No matter what the world said about him, even how, he, how they abused him, how they maligned him, but he continued to do the Father's will, right? Right, so that is the third one, to prepare your flesh to embrace and not to, not to dislike it. Now, then the fourth one, the fourth one. Now, when, when you go through all this, now we can, we can actually be tempted, right? be tempted to um, cover up. What do I mean by that? You are obeying the Lord in something, you know that is the right thing to do, that's the right way to live, and you're living it out. And then, difficulties begin. Other people oppose you, or maybe you know that to obey God and do what is right in God's eyes, um, not only trouble will begin, but you may face embarrassment. You may face um, shame. All right, for doing what is right because the rest of the world will look at such a thing as shameful, embarrassing, embarrassing for doing what's right. Now, whatever that situation may be, sometimes to obey God, to do what is right, well, to make the right decision, certain things may change in your family. Certain things may change in your relationships. Some things may be different from there on. And you find, ah, oh, it's so embarrassing. So embarrassing to obey God and do what is right. And then all these kind of things happen. Then you can cover up by, well, a few ways. Instead of embracing as if it is a blessedness to go through even all this. Instead of that, you cover up by, by giving excuses. All right? By giving excuses. You can cover up by, well, painting the whole situation differently. That people, when they perceive it, they, they don't realize that you're disobeying God. You, you, it seems like, well, what you're doing is fine. Well, you can cover up that way because you don't think that it is a beatitude, a blessedness to actually obey God to the extent where well, people may, may speak about you, your family, your personal life. You can also cover up. You can also cover up well, by pretending that nothing is wrong and then you continue to allow that sin, you continue to allow that, that, that thing in your life or in your family that displeases God, to continue to let that happen, but you cover up that sin. No one knows. Then you don't have to face embarrassment. You don't have to face the persecution of men. So, this last reason that is important for the believer to learn this beatitude is now go through any persecution any ridicule of men how people look at you how people what people will say about you be ready to suffer be ready to embrace it go through it accept it poised purpose your heart right prepare it position it to say, I will go through this. Now, how many singles get ridiculed, get, um, get um, embarrassed by people, relatives, just because, well, they're still single or God calls them to singlehood? And then there's the pressure. There's the pressure to just give in and just to well, marry anybody outside the will of the Lord, Right? So you begin to realize when you say, I want to live a life that pleases God, that's righteous, you must be prepared for the worst, the worst, the worst embarrassment, the worst situation, the worst embarrassment by the world to ridicule you, the worst um, um, consequences that can come. Now we study more of that. I'm just giving some ideas, all right, some ideas for us to remember. Now do not... Be 
someone who says, well, um, I leave out the beatitude so far as I don't get persecuted. Right? So that would be one of the temptations in the minds of the believers when they hear the Lord preaching the beatitude to them. Perhaps they feel right along the way, and that's exactly what happened to many of them. Right? When the Lord was um, captured, betrayed and captured, many of them would not embrace the persecution. They ran away. They ran away. Right? They were not willing to suffer even just being called the followers of Christ. So, sadly, for many of the believers, this particular beatitude which they heard earlier on did not grip their heart. Now, so, Christian, I am saying this again. I know this idea of being persecuted for righteousness' sake is, is a topic that we've covered in great detail. It's something that you, you at the back of your mind, you're always aware of it. But what, how, why I want to start this beatitude with this reminder about why it is important is the disciples, the apostles of Christ, those who walk with Christ day in, day out, saw his miracles, heard his teachings personally. When time of persecution come, came, they fled. They betrayed the Savior. So don't take this beatitude lightly. It is a preparation it is a preparation for you to be a soldier of Christ, not give in, not give up, not compromise, but keep living it out. Now with that, I hope it tells us, it reminds us, now why is it important for us to remember this? Now then, the next thing for us to now ask ourselves is, now, why does this happen? All right? Is it that the Lord just want to make life difficult for us. Now, another way to prepare our hearts to say, well, I embrace this beatitude, I embrace and I'm ready for persecution and when it happens, well, in my mind, I know how to think. Now, how should we think when persecution arises? And then say, well, I see through all this, I'm not going to give up or give in or feel embarrassed or be ashamed, all right? How? Well, now, let's see why, why the Bible tells us that persecution will come. So God, I mean, we just read, if you live godly in Christ, then persecution will occur, all right? Now, the first reason, 2 Timothy chapter 3, 2 Timothy chapter 3. Now, the very first reason is, is also mentioned here. Now, look at verse 13. So prepare your minds to think according to scriptures. Then you embrace this beatitude. Verse 13, But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Now, why is it that when the Christian live godly in Christ, there will be persecution? The reason is, evil men and seducers will wax worse and worse. All right? In other words, the wickedness in the world and the wickedness of men will get worse and worse. So for, for us in our times, we must realize that as well. I think if we are observant, we already know that. In the past, even certain um, beliefs and practices of Christianity is still lauded by the world as righteous, is correct. But today, in terms of lifestyle, in terms of values, it's completely different. Right? It's wax so horribly bad that what was something that the world used to even agree with the Christian today, they persecute us for believing in what God says about that matter, about lifestyles, about um, um, what is sin and what is not sin. So that's the first thing that the Christian um, can do to, to prepare your heart is simply to remember, it is only going to get worse, all right? It is only going to get worse. When you first became a Christian, you began to learn things and over time now, you begin to learn more and more. But don't think it's just going to get better. It will get worse. Because as you learn more, as you obey more closely to how God wants you to live, whether it's your family, whether it's in, in society, it will get worse. So that is how you prepare your heart. It, 
the more I obey God closely, the more persecution I will face simply because the world will get, the evil men will get worse. Evil men will get worse. Now, so that's one of the reasons why things get worse and it helps us to prepare our hearts. Now, the second one, the second one. Now, turn to the Gospel of um, John. We're going to see a few things here that Christ reveals to us to prepare us for accepting persecution. All right? John chapter 3, right? John chapter 3. Now, there are a few things that Christ repeatedly told the disciples to prepare themselves for and to be aware of. Right, John chapter 3. Now let's read verses 19 to 20. John chapter 3, verses 19 to 20, reading. And this is the condemnation, that light is come into the world, and men loved darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For every one that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. Now here God, Christ himself, personally prepared the disciples' mind. Persecution will come. Well, well, men will be wicked, but now they are stirred up also by the fact that they hate the light. They do not like righteousness. That is why they will do that to you. So don't be shocked. Now, when you embrace this beatitude and say, well, it is a blessed thing to suffer persecution for righteousness' sake. And at any time, your, your, heart's, your heart gets discouraged and your heart begins to feel, why? Why? Then simply remember, why do they do this to you? The flesh will say, doing right is good. How is it that in the world today, when we do what is right, we get persecuted? Well, it's simple, simply this. Man hate the light. That is all. Expect them to behave this way towards you. They hate righteousness. Your boss behaves in a certain way towards you because you want to do what is right, what is honest. They may even fire you. Don't go home wondering why, Lord, why. Just simply know they hate the light. They will do this. Now look at John chapter 3. And he says, lest his deeds should be reproved. Lest his deeds should be reproved. The Christian must know when you do what is right, their deeds get reproved. Anyone likes deeds being reproved? When you do something wrong and you receive reproof from scriptures, from, from someone else, you don't like that. All right? Now, how much more for the unbelievers? They will feel that you are trying to attack them. All right? They will, they will construe your attitude as criticizing what they're doing. That's how they will be. So, blessed are they who suffer for, uh, for righteousness' sake, must have this mindset. When you live like that, you must know in many ways they are going to feel that you, that, that, um, you are criticizing them, right? that you're, you are saying that you're ho you are right and they are wrong. It's going to be like that. In fact, when we studied First Peter, remember? Um, the society hated them, hated the Christians. Why? Because when the Christians got converted during that period, they stopped going to the Colosseums where, well, they will throw people in there and animals in there for sport, for fun, right? They have, the, they have very violent games, right, just for fun. It was a very violent society. And then they have um, um, all sorts of um, unseemly, all right, fornication that go on, goes on. And they don't, they don't attend all this. And the society began to hate them. They said, what are you trying to say to us? You know, that what we are doing is, 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 is um, so wicked, so shameful. So Christian, when you live out the Beatitudes, when you hunger and thirst after righteousness, for example, and do always that which is only right in God's eyes, well, their deeds are exposed and they feel that you reprove their deeds, right? So expect that. This is how to think. Don't be shocked. Don't be upset. 
God, why is it that I live right for you and now this is happening? Then just say to yourself, well, because the men are wicked. They don't like their deeds to be exposed. Now, next one, John chapter 7, verse 7. Besides that, they hate the light, they hate righteousness. John chapter 7, verse 7. Now, this is a great encouragement. John chapter 7, verse 7, shall we read together? Reading. The world cannot hate you, but it hateth me it hateth, because I testify of it, that the works thereof are evil. Now here, God simply reminds you, when the world hates you, please remind yourself, it is not so much that they are hating you and persecuting you. In reality, they hate me, they hate Christ, because you are doing what Christ tell you to, tells you to do that righteousness, that godliness. So this is a great comfort and help for the Christian to embrace persecution, to suffer persecution for righteousness sake. The reality is they hate Christ. They are doing it against Christ, right? Now when the great prophet was discouraged, right? Samuel was discouraged. The Lord told him the similar thing. In the Old Testament, they have not rejected you, Samuel. You were just simply doing what I told you to do. You were simply telling them what I told you to tell them. You were simply rebuking them for what I've told you to rebuke them for. They have not rejected you. They have rejected me. They have rejected me. And Christ says the similar things to the New Testament believers. When you live godly lives and the world persecute you hate you do all sorts of things to you we'll study what's the meaning of persecution and some examples all right just remember it is christ that they're fighting against i am just doing his will that is all so it helps you to embrace this beatitude all right now then last but not least turn to john chapter 15 all right john chapter 15 verse 19, right? John chapter 15. <clears throat> Let's read verses 18. Um, verses 18 and 19 together, reading. If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If ye were of the world, the world would love his own. But because ye are not of the world, but I've chosen you, out of the world. Therefore, the world hateth you. Verse 20, remember the word that I said unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they have kept my saying, they will keep yours also. Again, this persecution that the Christian will face in the world was, was, mentioned by Christ, and Christ gave them the comfort. Look at verse 18, chapter, John chapter 15, verse 18. Now, if the world hate you, please remember this. Please know this. He hated me before he hated you. Now, this is not only just because, well, um, in terms of timing, all right? It's, first and foremost, they hate what I stand for. They hate my righteousness. They hate that first. What I stand for, what I teach, they hated that first before they hate you. So Christian, when you suffer persecution for righteousness' sake, these are all the verses that must comfort you, must cause you to not think, not think that is strange, must not cause you to fear, must not cause you to feel discouraged, but rather, now be encouraged. Look at verse 19, John chapter 15, verse 19. Now, if, you're of, you, if you were of the world, the world would love his own, but because you're not of the world, but I've chosen you out of the world. Now, the very fact that God saved you, the, fact, the very fact that God chose you to obey his ways and to, and to be the light to the world, chose you to be light to the world by living out the beatitude, by living righteously, God chose you to do that. You are not of the world. You know what great encouragement is that? That even if they killed you, it doesn't matter because you are not of the world. 
Your salvation is sure. You are not of the world. Now, for Christ to give this encouragement to say, um, I've chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you, they will persecute you. In other words, suffering for righteousness' sake, all right, is something that is blessed. It's something that is blessed. Look at verse 20. Remember the word I said unto you, and that is the key aim tonight. This beatitude is going to be difficult, all right, compared to other beatitudes. But you must remember this word. What is the word? The servant is not greater than his Lord. If they persecuted Christ, they will also persecute you. Now, to live out the other Beatitudes is not easy. All right? It's not easy. And I hope that we have been, by the grace of the Lord, living them out. But to lift them out and yet suffer persecution is very difficult. It makes you want to give up. It makes you question. It makes you fear. It makes you want to just, well, ignore living righteously and just, just be accepted by the world, embraced by the world, liked by your school friends, liked by your colleagues, liked by everyone. But the Lord says, remember the word that I said unto you. If they persecute me, they will persecute you. Now, this is the privilege of suffering for Christ. This is the privilege to know that they do that to him, they will do that to me, means I am closely identified with him. Now, Christian, we, 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 we understood why. Uh, we understood um, why it's important and now why this will happen. And therefore, the Lord says, remember the word. I said unto you, they will persecute you because they persecuted me. Now, but we must not, in closing, um, have the wrong ideas, all right? Now, this is not encouraging us to go out and look for persecution. I want to be persecuted, so I'm identified with Christ. Okay, please understand that. Now, we are not to um, definitely not suffer for unrighteousness sake, all right? Crimes, um, um, evil, evil doing in society, if you get caught, if the government um, and the law persecutes you for it, um, or rather prosecutes you for it, this is not suffering for righteousness sake, all right? So I just want to make that very clear because I don't want anyone of, of us in, the, in our hearts thinking that as long as I'm being prosecuted for something, then, well, I am blessed. It is not true, especially students in school. Don't have the idea, right, that, well, the teacher doesn't like you um, because, you say, because I'm a Christian, yes, partially true only, right? They don't like Christians, so they don't like you, but partially true only. The other reality is, well, you're a disobedient student in school, disobedient child in school, right? You cause troubles and so on. So don't think that just because you're a Christian, they don't like Christians, and then you always attribute it to they are persecuting you for that. Same for the adult at the workplace. Now, it also does not mean um, that we provoke others by unnecessary offensive ways when we live out the Christian faith, all right? There's no need to stand up in your office and start um, telling people why they are wrong and this is sin and, and so on. You live out your beatitudes, your hunger and thirst after righteousness, you live it out. They are unbelievers, all right? If you need to correct, you need to change um, the situation. Well, the Bible says, the one before this, what's the, what's the beatitude before this? Blessed are the peacemakers. You want to reconcile them to truth. You want to get them to do right. You want to reconcile them um, to God, get them saved. We studied, blessed are the peacemakers, means even how you bring peace must be in a peaceful way, all right? A peaceful way, not in a way that, that causes more chaos, more turmoil, more hatred, all right? So suffering for righteousness sake, even when you live out righteousness, even when you need to correct and do what is right. It is, and if you do it in a way which, which results in you getting in trouble, you being um, persecuted, um, then please don't say that I'm being persecuted for righteousness' sake, all right? You do it 
correctly. For example, you find that something is wrong in the company. All right? You say, oh, I, I must be righteous. And then you go and blast it on the internet and everything without first talking to your company about what, needs to, what it should be and all that. And then you get, you get in trouble legally. Please don't say that you're, um, you are suffering for righteousness sake. All right? So remember the lessons from peacemakers, in other words. All right? So now other behaviors that are um, hypocrisy, obnoxious way of, of, of living out the Christian life, and then people ridicule you. The Christian, if you're ridiculed for, 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 your, for living according to righteousness, but you're doing, in a, you're doing it in a hypocritical way, an obnoxious way, and then you get in trouble, and then people re, um, um, ridicule you and shame you. You are not suffering for righteousness. You are suffering for your hypocrisy. You are suffering for your obnoxiousness. All right? You're suffering for your pride. That's what it is. All right? So I just want to make sure that we understand this as well. But if genuinely you, go, you are going through a difficult time now, simply because you want to study the Word, you want to obey God, you want to um, be in the right church, you want to do what is right as a single, as a family, and you suffer challenges. Now this message is an encouragement. The Lord says, remember the Word that I speak to you. They're attacking me, not you. Be encouraged. Continue in it. Satan will round his people. Satan will always, the prince of this world, will attack you. Know that. Accept that. Don't fear and give up. All right? So we need this in place before we study. Now, what is persecution? What is righteousness? All right? But first and foremost, in our hearts, we must have this clear that we may know how to think. Let us turn to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, Lord, we bow before you. As we come towards these last two Beatitudes, Lord, we begin to realize that you are encouraging us, preparing us, strengthening us, all to expect persecution from the world and even our families. Because living out the Beatitudes is living out righteousness. So, Father, we pray that in the weeks ahead, you help us to understand, learn about the various persecution that we should expect, and also what are the righteousness. Lord, we, as we live it out, we will also face persecution. And Father, now we pray that you be gracious to be in our midst, to hear our cries for your kingdom, for one another to live godly lives, to be courageous, to bring up godly families for you. So, Father, may you be gracious, Lord, to hear, and may you help each one of us to pray earnestly. Pray, Lord, with zeal and with a carefulness as we approach your throne of grace. And, Father, we ask and pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.